as uh, Matthew said, lovely to see so many of you here this afternoon. Thank you for joining me on a hopefully sunny Tuesday where where you are. Um, a busy day, I'm sure you've all had. I really appreciate you spending the time uh, with us um, at here at Twinkle. And hopefully you'll learn something about manipulatives in Key Stage 2 and add to your knowledge that you've already got. I'm so not sure what your, your backgrounds are, uh, but hopefully this will be something to add um, to your understanding of manipulatives. So let's uh, as we'll get started. Um, as uh, Matthew has said, we'll get this recorded um, to you and all the links that I talk about and highlight with your reflection documents so you can access those as well. If you have any questions during this, please put them in the chat as you think it and uh, Matthew and Dan will keep record of those for the end. But think them, put it down, and then it'll be there uh, to store for the end. And this obviously is based on my experience, um, my opinions, my reading, um, and based on how I've um, seen with my teaching career. So thank you again for joining, and hopefully we'll have a lovely um, hour or so together on a Tuesday. So first of all, who am I? So my name obviously is Rachel Wood, and I am Mass Advisor here at Twinkle. Uh, since se last September, relatively new to the role. Prior to working at Twinkle, I was a Key Stage 2 teacher for 18 years, which is a scary thought looking back. And most of that time, I led maths in two junior schools. They weren't primary, they were junior schools in South and on Sea Essex, where I live. And obviously, over those years, I've seen so much change in how maths is taught, curriculum-wise, office expectations, and so on. That looking back, it's evolved so much, and obviously, it'll continue to evolve in the future. Um, I also currently work at Twinkoff two days a week as a math advisor. I have two little boys who are two and four as well. And it's lovely seeing their love of maths already starting. My four-year-old starts school in September, and because I'm a key stage two teacher lovely to see how the EYFS is going to come forward. So I'm a bit cliche now, so I do apologise, but I really am passionate about maths. I love teaching everything, but maths has always been my love. I found my love, actually. And I really believe that everybody can succeed in maths. Obviously, government expectations now, teaching maths to 18, people have obviously their opinions on that. But I think with the right um, support and the right teaching and the right... Um, feeling towards maths we can really change how children feel about it and therefore succeed with everything in life if you enjoy what you're doing you're engaged you're happy you're open to success a lot more I think some children have a fear of maths it often comes from their parents sometimes as well and I want to change that view and all the all the years of teachers we've got children in our minds as well when you see that moment the children get something it, it's priceless um, so a little bit about me, I said lots of this started is based on my research theory, my personal experience in the classroom as well. Um, and uh, let's have a little look then. So what we're going to be doing then, so for our introduction, then looking about beliefs and assumptions, and we ask some of your opinions, if you want to put things in the chat, obviously you're more than welcome to. And look at manipulatives themselves and some examples of them and think that's how you might want to use them in a classroom. Um, I love theory, I love research, I love reading why things are true and why things happen. And I think if you know the theory behind something, it's always a way in for how to use it. And also explain somebody else why you're doing something. Having theory is always a use of useful backup and evidence for that. And look at effectiveness, because as always, it's how you teach something and how you do something is how effective it might be. So look at effectiveness and how to use manipulatives in an effective way. And we're also going to look at some resources we've got here at Twinkle. Obviously, you might use some of our Twinkle resources already. You might be new to Twinkle. Share some resources with you, which will be on that reflection document at the end, and hopefully some time for questions at the end. OK, so let's get started. Manipulatives. What do we mean by manipulatives? I asked my husband this and he said he didn't know. It's interesting. He's obviously he's not a teacher, I should say. Um, and I think manipulatives are anything you can hold, you can manipulate, to manipulate it. So it's something that you can physically pick up in maths, you can you can move, you can use to enhance your teaching and the children's learning. So they can physically pick up and they can actually, some children like to hold things anyway. I always hold a pen when I was a teacher. That was my thing, I like to hold something. I think that also allows children to help with their learning as well. So it's just a few examples. Now, obviously, there are, the list is endless, as it's just a few that um, 
I've got here to show you how you might want to use them. So the bead string, obviously this is key stage two um, focused, but also we use them across the board. And my big thing this afternoon is they don't stop in key stage one and there aren't key stage one, key stage two, it should be across the board. So the bead string, physically moving that number, that bead, for some children is so powerful because some children working in the abstract find it very, very difficult. So if you've got a bead string, that might be a five, a 10, 100, whatever it might be, actually ask the children to physically move it and count, whatever they might be, counting in ones, fives, ten, whatever, actually the act of physically doing it will first of all engage them and also will help with their understanding as well, physically doing it. Um, Joanne can't see, don't everybody else see it? Think. Yes, lovely, thank you. So, so thank you, sorry then the person who can't, I don't quite know therefore. Um, so with the bead string, what's the place value counters? Um, so these are obviously quite a new concept. I remember must have been over the year now going back, I was at a maths um, training session and I just obviously created was maths, maths lead, there's a new thing, there's a new curriculum introduced, these counters were here and they were fantastic because they were really sort of focusing on decimals to tens of millions and I'm sure you see them in your classes as well, your schools, but they're fantastic for showing place value, but they're also superb for showing the operations and how they can be used. We've got a video later on how they can be used in one of the formal methods. So they're fantastic for showing different place value and for discussing it. With all things with, with manipulatives, it opens up discussion, opens up conversation with children. Multi-link cubes, interlocking cubes, they've obviously been around um, for a very long time. Um, they can be used for so many different reasons. And I think people think of them in key stage one, but also key stage two. If you're doing obviously counting, if you're doing whatever it might be, they're great. But also think about for introducing ratio, thinking about ratio of, of three to four or red to blue. We'll get the blocks out, get the cubes and physically make it. Children then can see it. Children can actually understand that ratio. If you're looking at cube numbers, for some children telling them that two times two times two is how you do a cube number is like, oh, I don't understand why. Make it, got the cubes there, actually physically do it. Children then will see it. You might want to have it in front of you. So, right, can you make three cubed for me now? How many cubes am I going to do? Let's actually build it. And it's not just for your lower attained children, it's across the board. Physically doing something and explaining something and seeing it allows their understanding to go deeper. So it's not just counting them, it's thinking, how can we use this? The proportions, the ratio, whatever it might be. Counting straws, they could be straws, they could be lollipop sticks, it could be pipe cleaners, it doesn't matter what it is. Budgets are tight, I know, there's lots of things that can become manipulative. You're working on uh, grouping, we'll get the, get the straws or the lollipops, whatever they might be, put a band around them, I've got a group of five there. How have I got two groups of five, what have I got now? For some children, the times tables, year four, they've got to nail them, finding a way to get in. It might be just that, actually putting those straws in a group, how many have I actually got in counting them? Physical act of doing it, they're going to A, remember it, and it's going to go deeper in understanding. 100 square, been around for so long, so oh, oh long, on the table, laminate it, have it there. Children that can access it, I'm sure lots of you do already, but there's so many you can do with that. If you're looking at multiplications, for example, you're looking at well, adding 10 or adding nine, add 10, take one away. Actually having it there for some children is enabling them to answer those questions. It's giving them a way in, you're not doing it for them. They're having to use that 100 square correctly but it's just giving them a way to access the question. And also with everything, it's opening up the conversation again. Talking to children, right, with 100 square, how can I use this to answer that question? Children are having to talk with their maths talk. Open-ended questions come from it. Dominoes. Love dominoes. So my four-year-old already likes playing dominoes. There's so much comes from it. Subitizing, for example, you can just see that's six, that's one. Think about what you could actually do with it. 
they say they could play a game you say right what have you got your total what's the total what's the total number of dots that will be there on a dominoes game actually get them to work it out so yes they're actually physically picking it up but actually having to do something with them as well and as we all know when they're playing a game they don't think they're actually learning they think they're just having fun playing games and actually having maths games available is so so powerful for their understanding and also it gets them children might be a bit fearful of maths they're doing it without even realizing so you might save dominoes right you've got a four and a five both one together what have you got oh i've got 20 okay it's those open-ended questions that just come from almost like evolve organically with how you're when you're playing any game it might be dice i used to use dice loads when i was teaching it could be a six could be nine could be 20 could be so there are lots of different types of dice you've got out there got big dice get outside or get in the hall get them moving around as well or at the table too i used to use them a lot if i was generating questions rather than giving them questions it's very sort of i would say dull not quite the right word but very much prescriptive give them the dice themselves make that yourself what's your question roll it four times what have you got what number have you got? Okay, or well, yours four times. What have you got? Who's is bigger? So once again, you're talking, you're doing place value, roll the dice, create the number. What's each digit worth? Presume probability. Dice obviously is the obvious thing to use. Because they're physically doing something, so it gets them mobile as well, rather than sitting at the table, just sitting there, get them doing things as well. It's going to make a deeper understanding, but also they're going to remember it. And it becomes part of their understanding and once again they're working together you might have two dice add them together multiply them what could we do with this give them the dice grab their own game with it more hands-on learning to get them engaged what they're doing uh base 10 deans i said before i was a mass lead in two different junior schools um this was my first school i was only a mass lead as i am second year teacher right the deep end it was right head of maths now and it was the first summer and I was saying, right, the math shelves are absolute state. It was a big fourth entry junior school. It was a really big school, very old school as well. There's so much stuff everywhere. It was just a bit mind boggling. Nothing was really in the classrooms, always on these big shelves. So I said, right, I tied the shelves up. On the top shelf were all these big boxes of this base, of base 10. And I said to the head, we had this. Why, why aren't we using it? He said, it's a bit old fashioned now. I thought, like, oh, no, it's not. It's not old fashioned at all. It was terrifying. He said that. And obviously, place value counters are great when you're using them for your column methods or um, partition, whatever it might be. But base 10 is a very different purpose. You've got your ones, you've got your rods for your 10. And for some children, knowing that, that one of those makes 10 of those is so powerful. And if you're doing a partitioning lesson, whatever it might be, ask them to make it. So how could you make 145 actually using that equipment? And once again, it's the conversations that comes from it. That if you give the children the equipment, more likely to talk, and then you as the teacher, if you're lucky enough to have a TA with you as well, them too, can get into the classroom and actually talk to those children. You can see there's understanding without a gap there, how they use the equipment, how they're talking. And once again, it's that physical apparatus of holding it and manipulating and actually moving it around. But the base 10, the counters, very different in how they are. Because some children will look at those counters and just see them as they're just different colours. Whereas they need that physical 100, 10, 1 block to see it. Digit cards, I used to use these all the time. We used to love laminates, they cut them all up, having them there for the children to use. Once again, looking at number, get them to use their own numbers. What, what, what can I make from that? Maybe if you could, you could say, right, turn them all over and pick five. What have you got? What number have you got? And then you could say to them, right, well, those numbers you've got there, rearrange them to be them the greatest number it can be from those digits. And conversely, the smallest number. So you've got the classic SATS question which comes up, put the numbers in there. But they're actually doing it themselves. They turn them over, they're doing it themselves. They could be in pairs. Pick four cards each. Who's got a greater number? How much greater is it? If you moved the cards around, come with the 
biggest number you can both make, who has now got a larger number? Is it the same person? Have two sets, what could you make now? So many different things, don't have to take very long either, because they've got so much covering lessons, just be a quick, the old ornamental starter that we used to always do, but the quick things, get them engaged and moving around. Uh, number rods or cues and air rods, don't see them as often now, but like base 10, um, but so useful for place values, so useful for finding how numbers go together, what their values are. So there's just a few there. That was just, there are so many more that we could use. And also, as I said before, they don't have to be anything fancy. You can make manipulatives as well. If you've got a children who run up dinosaurs or use figures, anything that helps them find their way in and actually move things around, they clearly understand what they're doing and how they're doing it. I'm sure there's lots of others that you can think of in your yourself as well. Just a little few there to look at. Okay, a little break from me uh, talking for a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm going to um, think about your own beliefs and assumptions. Have a little think about these. I'll show you three questions um, on the screen in a minute. They're taken from the Education Endowment Foundation. Links on the um, on the sheet you're going to get as well. It's there an article they put a blog they put on there. And the interesting questions, and they pose them, and obviously the outcomes put on there. I'm going to pose them to you now. So. Here they are. Are manipulatives more useful for younger children or should they be used throughout the school? Should we discourage these manipulatives in older children as they cannot be used in examinations? Obviously, SATs is looming. Era. And does it matter which manipulatives are used? OK, so there's just three questions there. Just have a little think to yourself and put something in there and um, then anything you could put through. I totally agree, it's really used throughout the school. I'm glad you agree with me. And put in the chat, feel free to have a little think to yourself. Just a little think, just to have a little moment. I agree. Okay. Yes. Definitely not really discouraged. Lovely. Children have access. Good. Totally. Every child. Exactly. I'm so, I'm so glad you feel the same way as me. Thank you for those. Definitely. It's not about exams. Yes. Encourage youth. Yes. Thank you. Right, thank you for that. I think it's always it's always a great yes, under visualizer, definitely. Thank you, every child. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for those. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. I think key stage one, EYFS is almost everyone does it. Key stage two, I used to almost say to children, why don't, let's do it, let's do it, come on. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, they shouldn't get dependent. I'm gonna come back to that. Thank you. Fantastic point. I'm going to come on to that as well. Right. So, manipulatives, though. They can, a word is there, can in, help pupils engage with mathematics, but they are just tools. It's how they're used. And that's what's come out through a few things there. They can help, but they're just the tools. There should be a clear rationale for using them and why it's being used, not as an afterthought. If you go into a lesson, I've observed many lessons over the years in, in maths, and some class you go into, and they clearly they've been put on the table for my benefit. And I also, like, oh, what are we doing today? Now, was this not really sure we've got these cubes today? Have you used them before? No. You're like, oh dear. It should be embedded throughout a clear rationale why you're doing it, not as an afterthought, because with that, the children understand what they're doing. I've also observed many lessons where I've gone in and they've been doing a column addition and they've got their face value counters in a nice little bowl on the table so they're all nice and organised. They get their counters and they're moving them around their place, their, their mat, and it's wonderful because they're supporting their learning. But as somebody very wise said in the, in the chat, it's not the end point. It should be a temporary and only being used as a scaffold 
till independence is achieved. Yes, across the year groups and no particular age, as I put there. It's not, right, they use it in year two, but not in year three. Or they are in year five now, I'm going to stop doing that. So independence is achieved, but not at a particular age. They should know why they're doing it, and it's on part of their journey to independence with everything. You've got to learn how you do it. You can't run before you can walk. So you can help as long as you explain why and the children know why. As I said, all of my time has been spent in Key Stage 2. I've heard so many phrases over the years. There's just a few to throw out from teachers and pupils, I should say. We don't use counters in Year 5. They should need to use the clocks down there in Year 6. That's what they do in lower school. They're preparing for SATs. They shouldn't need to use that. I don't draw a bar model. I just use column addition. And, it's men and this is endless. It should be someone popped up there. It should be a choice. They should understand what they need to use and why. If you're introducing ratio or introducing proportion, I used to have heard the count, color counters out. Right, let's do it. The children loved it for a start. I was like, oh, this is really fun. And also, they understood what they were doing. They could clearly see the different colors that was going on. Time. I think everyone dreads teaching time. I used to always. It was an anomaly, wasn't it? Of some children found maths really challenging but got time really quickly and vice versa lots of children in year six who can't tell the time yet they need to use a clock let them use the clock have it there on the table that's what we need to be doing encouraging children to get it when they need to not say oh, year three using the clocks this week we can't do it make time make sure they can accessible for everybody well, it's lower upper school thing. We used to have a big thing at that one of my previous schools, lower school, upper school. No, we're all one part of one journey. We're all in it together. SATs around the corner. We can't deny that. We know that. However, it is just a test. I know it's huge, hugely important for school, those results. I know that. But for children, it's just one day, one test. We're part of their whole learning journey. If they need to use equipment, let them use it. Don't tell them they can't because they've got SATs coming. And also teachers feel that way. The pressure says to them, no, no, you can. But that last one there about bar modelling is quite a relatively new, I think, approach in, in schools. And some children are like, oh, I'm not doing that. And it used to teach a group of year fives. I wasn't their teacher. I was um, supporting them as a separate group. Um, and they, were, they didn't want to draw a bar model. I said, I'm not doing that. No, don't do that. And it was this real battle I was having with these 10 year olds. It's like, what? Well, why? It looked like the image that you can't do something because you know we don't do it anymore. We don't do that way. Yes, we can. I think as teachers, we need to show all different ways of presenting things, different operations, different ways to enable children to find the way that fits them. Independence is our end point, yes, but it's how we get there. And if you can explain something in a different method, different presentation, different image, then you're showing that you have a better understanding as well. And the list is endless. I had parents as well. So many phrases over the years I've heard are kind of gone, oh, and smiled slightly, obviously. Okay, then. So it shouldn't be seen this way. The research, so I read lots of research on this, and it showed that they need hands on visual hooks. So we can talk about CPA later the concrete, the pictorial, the abstract. Abstract is our end point, our independence. They need a concrete, and also visual hooks are important as well. And it's I'm saying new concepts. So when they're starting to learn to count, like my, my four-year-old, for example. But also in algebra, when they first introduce algebra, some children, it's like, I've just got numbers down going through letters at me. What what? What does this mean? And I think also you hear parents then come and say, Oh, didn't like algebra at school, what's the point of algebra? And then we hear those messages and they almost kind of become sit down to children. It's like, no, no, algebra is so important for daily life in so many different ways. So if you're introducing algebra, I don't know, 4x plus 5, well, what could x be? x or anything, right? x is 5. Let's get 5 cubes then, right? I've got 4 lots of x. I've got 4 lots of 5. How have I got there? Oh, 4 times I could do that. Oh, that's 20. Right, okay, then let's add down 5 more. Oh, 25, okay then. It's now no longer scary. But getting things, physical things, actually saying, right, there are cakes in that picture. I bring cakes, I bring chocolate, I make it lots of fun. Anything, they can actually get that hook to get them in and to think, right, what does this actually mean? 
and they remember it as well. It's the engaging. Lots of people popped up saying it's more engaging. It is much more engaging. They remember it, and then when they come to the abstract, they're like, oh, remember when we got that out? Oh, I remember now. Or if you're doing ratio for the first time, get colour counters out or the coloured um, multi-link out, whatever it might be. And if we remove them, then we're denying them most powerful tool of learning. If we go straight to the abstract, we're losing that journey. My mum was there when she was at school, she's in her 70s, my mum now, and she said, we didn't ask questions, we just did it. We didn't ask why we were doing something. We just crossed out the number and put the number up there and we just did it. Isn't that awful thing? And now, see, our children now have been given the skills to ask questions, challenge, talk to each other, and have all this equipment to help that journey. But effectiveness is the most important. Effectiveness for things, how you do it. I've seen, I've seen so many teachers teach over the years, and some, you just look at them, you think, wow, that's just incredible. It's how they almost... I'll explain it first of all, equipment they use, allowing the children to be so engaged. What we don't want is teachers at the front just talking, children just doing something. It should be that conversation coming back and forth and the same with equipment, how it's used effectively. So the show, studies have shown, as we talked before, they can enhance learning. However, they need to be shown how to use them. So these two questions here. Can they use the equipment they've been given and relate what they are doing practically? Or are they just mimicking how the equipment is used? So let me think about um, my own practice as well over, so over the years, thinking like, when I did that lesson, was I just showing them to do something? Or was I always explaining the best I could be? The teachers are always their own worst enemy sometimes, always explaining, thinking, I could have done that better, I could have done that better. I think as long as you're doing something under a visualizer, maybe fantastic things in the classroom or with a group of children or on the carpet or outside, use the equipment, then get them to do it straight away or tell you what you're doing rather than just copying you. Because if they're not used effectively, then it can have the opposite effect. It can have a detrimental effect on learning. It becomes in the way, it comes, they fuss with it. They need to know clearly, a clear rationale again of why I'm using those counters for that column subtraction or that short multiplication or partitioning number in that way. Why am I doing it? And that's what's so important. It's they're just not mimicking you, explaining what they're doing effectively. But remember this as well. The manipulatives are concrete objects. Great. We can hold them. We can physically move them around. But they're representing a concept that requires abstract thinking. The representation of a concept, not the concept itself. So it's not doing it for you. They've got to understand what it is they need to do, but the equipment has given them the tools to do it. And they also need the time to relation to uh, between the concrete material and the abstract concept. So hopefully as a school, you've got policies um, for methods that are going across right from uh, YFS to year six if you're a primary school, how the equipment's going to be used, how your methods are taught, so that progression is there. So when they go into year five, they're used to using something and it's evolved that way. They need time to know why it's going to be useful. If they're doing a bar model, for example, of a, a visual. They need to understand why that's important. One of the year fives as well, I worked with until why it was important, they use them all the time. But it's understanding the clear rationale behind it and showing why it's effective, not just doing something. With everything, it's what are they learning? Our mastery approach, we're all moving together, a deeper understanding, not just rushing off the more able children to the next thing, a deeper understanding to so understand the concept they're trying to solve. So I mentioned this before, the CPA. Uh, lots of schools obviously follow this approach concrete the pictorial the abstract but just to clarify it builds up as it goes to get to the understanding of the abstract at the end so concrete they're introduced to a new concept to the concrete resources whatever age they might be the pictorial when they're comfortable with that move on to the picture representation of the object. So that's why you've got your screens up on the, you can use your place value counters on the screen, you've got your base 10, you can actually have a physical on the screen, physical in a hand, visual up on the screen. 
and then move on to the abstract. Because that's what we want them to get to at the end. We want them to become not reliant on it, but use it to solve something abstract at the end. So you introduce your concept, might be ratio, as I've said before, with your counters. Then you can go to an image. I used to photograph them as well with my classes, put them in their books. They'd have to have a picture of the ratio, and then they'd have to use that one too. And then they go on to the abstract. But going through that journey also reminds them, oh, we did that they've got a deeper understanding not just doing something for understanding why okay so a couple of examples here them being used this first one is um taken from a said intervention for year five just an image i've taken from there and i was looking at partitioning so you can see we've got a part whole model and you've got the place value counters there representing 13,452. Um, so they've had to understand place value. And now they're showing it with those counters. So they've taken that number apart into their tens of thousands and so on. But obviously from that, you can ask so many more questions. You can say to them, right, if I take one counter away, what have I now got? How, what's, done, what's different about the number with one counter removed? If I take a one of the thousands, what have I now got? So once again, it's conversation, it's discussion, it's talking and actually asking each other questions. You could do this outside. You could do this on a whiteboard. They could just draw the whole model, have it laminated on a card and then use those counters and put them in the correct place. You can put numbers up on the screen, right? What's that number? Make your counters, show them when you've done. So once again, they work at their own pace, they're manipulating, they're moving it around and seeing what they can create. And once again, they can work in pairs, work in groups, and have a conversation. Um, part of my work here at Twinkles, we're working with our uh, VCC team who are creating maths videos. Uh, they're fantastic for last minute Saturday revision as well. And uh, they are they're about five minutes and they look at different areas of maths. There's a little clip I want to show you of a snippet of one of these videos, which shows how you can use our counters as a visual to support the abstract. So this is from a short multiplication video, um, just to show you a little part of how you can use your counters in an abstract to show the abstract method next to it. So, and it's only short, turn my microphone off so it doesn't echo from me. the single digit. Let's complete the calculation 2413 multiplied by 4. I'm going to use place value counters alongside the written method. When we partition the number we have two thousands, four hundreds, one ten and three ones. Our multiplier is four so we will multiply each part by four starting with the ones because that is the smallest value digit in our number. Three ones multiplied by four equals 12 ones. We know when we have 10 or more in one column we need to regroup. So let's regroup 10 of these ones counters into one tens counter. This leaves us with two ones in the ones column. Now let's multiply the tens. One ten multiplied by four equals four tens. With the regrouped 10, we have five tens altogether. Now we need to multiply the hundreds. Four hundreds multiplied by four equals 16 hundreds. We regroup 10 of these hundreds into 1,000. This leaves us with six hundreds. Finally, we multiply the thousands. Two thousands multiplied by four is eight thousands. Add the regrouped thousand to make nine thousands in total. We can now clearly see that 2,413 multiplied by 4 equals 9,652. This is called the product. Okay, as you see from there, how obviously it was the head up on the screen, you could do it physically as well, but they got the abstract too. So if we're just teaching the abstract, children don't understand why they're doing something. So you've got the visual there, you could obviously manipulate it yourself, you could show them, you show it up on there and you've got the abstract. We're going towards the abstract, we're going towards the end result, 
but how we're getting there. Okay, we're looking obviously at key stage two for around this afternoon, but it doesn't end there. When those children leave you in July from year six, go off to year seven, I always, always wonder what they're going to be doing, what happens there. And there was this the study that the NCETM did um, in a school in Halifax. The link obviously is on your uh, reflection document at the end to read the full article. But they did something very similar up, in, up there. So what they did in key stage three is they said they should be used beyond key stage two. So we're also doing at key stage two, they should use them here. But they said in CTN, they should go beyond key stage two, which I agree. So school in Halifax was chosen and they gave the place value counters. And as you can imagine, lots of different reactions they had from staff and uh, children to that, but not to low attaining children, across the ability range, which we've always been saying all the time this afternoon. Not as an alternative to algorithms, the way of understanding what the algorithm is really doing. Like on that video there, we had the algorithm, we had the standard short multiplication for method, but it's how it's doing. And unsurprisingly, what they found from the teachers who were reluctant to use them was that the open-ended questions came from it. And they encouraged students to talk and to discuss their maths and develop a deeper understanding. So they found that they were reluctant to use them but using manipulatives in key stage three enabled those children to have access to the curriculum, to talk about their conversation with maths, talk about their methods, and actually go deep with their understanding. Not just the lower retaining children, ones who may be with a, challenge, with a challenging concept, but across the board. So although key stage three, they can still use them there. So I think what we need to show is manipulatives are used throughout the board and images and representations should be used for everybody. Okay, so a couple of little quotes here to show you just to before I share some resources with you. This was done in 2015, so a few years ago now, hopefully it's moved on from there. So a lady called Joe Bowler said, proficient problem solvers frequently use representations to solve problems and communicate results. Though representation is a critical part of mathematical work, it is often the first thing proficient problem solvers do, it is rarely taught in classrooms. And I used to say to this to children who are reluctant to draw that diagram, reluctant to use a model or an image. And so there's so many occupations, you can be an engineer, go into architecture, whatever it might be, you need to draw those diagrams and be able to explain something. And if you're a good problem solver, drawing a picture, using equipment, having the skills to say, what do I need to solve this? Then you're going to go far. Having that idea of what do I need to do? Another one here, Caroline Hamilton, who was a maths hub lead for White Rose Maths Hub. Lots of people use White Rose uh, materials. She says, manipulatives and pictures should be offered to all students to aid conceptual understanding and as a focus to encourage verbalization of the maths children are doing. However, manipulatives should not become a crutch to enable a student to carry an operation they do not understand. So it shows, encourages talking, encourages communication, but they need to understand what they're doing. Manipulative won't solve the problem for them, but enables them to do something they have an understanding of and to extend that knowledge. Stop becoming a crutch, they need to know why they're doing something and they can talk about their conversation, talk about their maths, encourage that verbalisation. If children talk about their work from others, we know they learn from others, we know that a silent classroom has obviously has a part to play sometimes, but talking to each other, why are you doing that? Oh, that's interesting. They're going to extend their own knowledge as well. Okay. Right, a lot of information there, I know. And uh, there's just a few resources that I've highlighted. The links are on the um, sheet for you to, it might be of use to you. These are the videos that I um, showed a little clip of one of them. Uh, they're very new to the site. There's so many different ones, different strands of maths, different aspects um, there to help prepare for SATs for a couple of weeks time, but also to show how different things can be used. So you've got a uh, part whole, you use lots of number lines on there. So in different representation, but also you've got the equipment used to show how it could be done. And um, things are very expensive. Mass budgets are often nil. 
had that many a time, should I order something? No, got no money, like, okay. Um, so you can download things from our site and you can laminate them and you can use them there. Fractionals obviously are great, fraction um, wheels, got the dominoes there, lots of different things, the fraction mats, lots of different things you can use to have on the table, have access to them, children can go and get them, also know where they are in the classroom. Um, short multiplication, short division, you've got the mats there like we had on the video, and if you haven't got the counters, you can, long job I know, cut them out and got them there for you to use and actually do it on, on the on the on the mat and then a, a book they can write the answer there or they've got obviously on the screen there you can see that the square grid they can write it on their whiteboard pen and see rub it off and use it again um you may use some of our planning obviously i don't obviously I don't know what scheme you use if any uh, the interventions they are really handy you can see as the image there you've got the group of children using equipment they're designed to keep up not catch up as, a, as um, our phrase says children don't understand a concept intervention is there you can use got ideas for equipment ideas for representations and can be used to support those children and lots of our resources our master resources are following the line with white rose which you might use white rose and they're on there that you can um, obviously access to support and teach with your children um Matthew here, who's obviously part of our CPD team. There's lots of different CPD resources available. I've just put number lines on there and a, a CPA little video. But there's lots. You might have new teachers joining you in September. You might want to use your own knowledge as well. Um, little aspects of that. Lots of different things you can read about how to use them in a classroom uh, for your own um, sort of knowledge and how to enhance obviously your your teaching. Uh, the video link will be on the um, reflection sheet for you to look at as well.